The story begins with Femisha, a girl marked by misfortune, fleeing into the night as her own villagers chase her. The village chief condemns her, declaring that those born without stars, like Femisha, bring bad luck and shouldn't exist. As dawn breaks, Femisha, exhausted, navigates through the forest to her secret hideouts. She gathers her belongings hidden in magic bags, cookware, books, potions, and other necessities, relieved that her pursuers haven't found her main stash. Femisha is no ordinary girl. She's a human reincarnated from another world. Although her memories of her past life are faint, she occasionally hears whispers from it. Resigned to a life devoid of happiness due to her harsh experience, Femisha decides to emotionally detach from her village that has shunned her. While trying to move forward, she struggles to climb a hill, nearly tumbling off a cliff. Femisha longs for practical skills like others in her village. Her past self reminds her not to lament her birth, urging her to start anew. In her journey, Femisha stumbles upon a dumping ground. Her familiarity with the place suggests she scavenged here before. She rummages through the garbage, finding usable clothes and a map that falls out of a pocket, which could help her navigate. Amidst the trash, she also discovers expired potions. Although discolored, Femisha hopes they might still be effective, musing on the irony of an unwanted child like her relying on discarded items. Her scavenging is interrupted by the sound of a tamer and his slimes nearby, tasked with clearing the trash. Femisha realizes they're searching for her. The tamer, communicating with his colleague, suspects that Femisha is heading to Lathoff, the nearest village. They express unease about the chief placing a bounty on a young girl, considering it an extreme measure. Femisha, in shock, overhears her pursuers saying they'll take her dead or alive. Realizing the village chief wants her gone for good, she tries to escape but accidentally falls off a cliff. Luckily, her bag catches on a branch, saving her from a worse fate. Injured, she has to use several healing potions, which are old and not very strong. Later, she finds a clear river and takes a moment to relax, something she's never experienced due to a life spent hiding. Femisha resolves to be bold, recalling the fortune teller's advice to disguise herself as a boy for safer travel. She cuts her hair, changes into boyish clothes, and decides to adopt a new name. Her past self suggests the name Ivy, likening her to the resilient plant. As Ivy continues her journey, she's captivated by a unique, light-emitting slime. Upon closer inspection, she finds it adorable. Checking her monster compendium, she learns it's a rare, unnamed slime, often called the weakest or disintegrating slime. Identifying with the slime's vulnerability, Ivy feels a connection. When a breeze threatens to blow the slime away, she learns it's so delicate it could disappear with a mere touch or strong wind. Ivy gently assists the struggling slime, saddened to read that its lifespan is less than a day. Realizing how little is known about this rare creature due to its brief existence, Ivy is moved by its fragility. Another gust of wind nearly sends the slime into the river, but Ivy quickly saves it. She decides to stay with the slime, understanding its transient nature and wanting to cherish its brief time. In Orjagoos, Ivy explains, humans receive skills marked with stars when they turn five. Her parents had skills in carpentry, needlework, and mending, each marked with stars as a measure of proficiency. These stars, bestowed by the gods, often dictate one's future. However, when Ivy turned five, she received a taming skill but with no stars. Unable to tame even the smallest animal, let alone monsters, she became known as a starless tamer. This revelation changed the way her village, even her own parents, treated her. She lost her sense of belonging. Ivy shares with the slime about her past life and the fortune teller who educated her and gifted her magical bags. These bags could carry numerous items without feeling heavy. Ivy becomes emotional, revealing the fortune teller's recent death, which left her feeling utterly alone. Ivy tells the slime that he is the very first friend she made and wished that they can stay together. The next morning, Ivy wakes up to find the slime gone, thinking it disintegrated as expected. Surprised by her own sadness, she resolves to head to the royal capital, following the fortune teller's advice. To her joy, she finds the slime alive inside her magic bag, proving some information in the compendium wrong. In the forest, Ivy tries taming the slime by channeling her magic into it. The slime glows, accepting her efforts, and she names it Sora, marking the successful taming with a symbol on its forehead. Ivy, excited to have a companion, happily introduces herself to Sora. Later, Ivy traps and butchers her tenth field mouse, showing respect for its sacrifice. She wonders about her previous life's lifestyle, as her past self often reacts strongly to such tasks. Ivy prepares the meat neatly, planning a feast with Sora for the night, keeping the slime safe in her bag. Checking her map, Ivy realizes the royal capital isn't even shown, signifying the long journey ahead from her current remote location. Ivy decides to head towards Odal, a nearby town, for safety. A gust of wind almost sweeps away her companion slime, Sora, but she catches him just in time. 
Sensing danger, she quickly hides in the trees, narrowly avoiding a group of monster ants marching by. Once the ants pass, Ivy feels relieved and notices that Sora has grown slightly larger and heavier. She then feels a sting on her face, realizing she's been cut by a branch. Acting quickly, Ivy applies several expired blue potions to her wound, healing it but depleting her potion supply. As she approaches the village, Ivy notices wanted posters with her image in a hefty reward of 500 Dao. Each poster portrays her differently, making her recognize that she's now a fugitive. In the village, Ivy is struck by how much skills and magic are integrated into everyday life. Passing a bakery, she longs for bread, something she hasn't had in a long time. She also considers selling the field mice she's hunted at a butcher's shop but hesitates. The butcher, sensing her presence with his two-star odor skill, invites her over and praises the freshness and quality of her catch, offering her 100 dal for it. He expresses interest in buying more, as most hunters are focused on larger game. With her earnings, Ivy buys bread at an affordable price, amusing the bakery owner with her innocence. The villagers mistake her for a boy, indicating her disguise is effective. Finding a secluded spot, Ivy shares her bread with Sora, but the slime shows no interest in eating. Ivy learns that Sora, the rare slime, communicates no by spreading itself out. She's curious about what it eats. The next day, she successfully catches a bunch of field mice in the forest and finds a dumping ground full of expired potions. To her surprise, Sora devours the blue potions, revealing a unique ability to dissolve inorganic material, a trait of high-level rare slimes. Ivy tests this by offering a vase to Sora, but the slime refuses. She then offers a red potion he declines that too and shows a preference for blue potions only. The slime sees more blue portion and starts devouring it. Ivy asks him to leave some for her too. After selling her field mice for 250 dao, Ivy visits the bakery and is gifted an extra loaf of bread. She enjoys a peaceful moment by a stream, cleaning up and savoring her bread, wishing these tranquil times would last. Later, she encounters some adventurers and narrowly avoids recognition due to her changed appearance. The adventurers mistake her for a boy and tease her, prompting Ivy to leave quickly. Back in the village, Ivy's fear heightens when she sees her wanted poster. Despite receiving more free bread from the bakery owner, her fear of being discovered forces her to leave the village abruptly. She's saddened to depart, especially since the villagers were kind. On her journey, at a crossroads, Ivy hesitates, unsure of which direction her hunters took. Sora tries to communicate something, but Ivy can't decipher it. Regretting her hasty departure and now hungry and thirsty, she chooses a path and finds a tree with delicious fruits. However, Sora's disapproving gesture and shivering alert her to danger. The tree transforms into a monster, attacking her and revealing her pursuers. In a tense moment, the tree monster's root lunges at her, but Sora saves her just in time. Injured and losing strength, Ivy falls unconscious. She thinks of healing her wound but realizes that she has no potion. Lastly, she sees Sora jump onto her wound. She fears the worst, thinking Sora might be consuming her, as some slimes are known to digest humans. This bring an end to our episode. In Ivy's dream, she remembers her childhood. Her father, Tablo, was a woodcarver who heard a baby's cry one day, signaling the birth of a new family member. He rushed inside and was congratulated for the arrival of a baby girl. Tablo praised his wife for giving birth to such a beautiful child and decided to give his daughter a name. Ivy's mother loved the name, and they introduced themselves. As Ivy grew older, she started bringing lunch to her older brother and father while they worked. They would take a break and enjoy the bread she brought. One time, Ivy almost choked on her food, but her father quickly summoned water to help her. Her older brother teased her for eating too quickly, but Ivy explained that she needed to eat a lot because she was growing. Tableau laughed and expressed his wish for her to grow big and strong. Her older brother complained that their father was always lenient with Ivy. When they returned home in the evening, they were greeted by her elder sister, Facilla. Facilla asked Ivy to set the table for dinner, and her brother teased her about when she would start using everyday magic. Ivy confidently replied that she would start using it soon. Her mother reassured her that there was no need to rush, as everyone develops at their own pace. Ivy's ability to help with housework at such a young age was admirable. Facilla mentioned that their mother had eagerly anticipated Ivy starting to use everyday magic at her age, which sometimes made Ivy feel like she received special treatment for being the youngest. During dinner, Facilla, their mother, served everyone's favorite stew. They all enjoyed the meal together, and Tableau mentioned how Facilla's soothing skill helped him relax after a long day of work. The family spent quality time together, completing various tasks and sharing updates about their day. Tableau talked about his work and Ivy's older brother mentioned that he would finish making the furniture that week. He also praised their mother's sewing skills and quickly completing the sofa cushions. 
Ivy noticed her mother crying, and she apologized, explaining that she was sewing bridal wear for the shoemaker's daughter. This made her realize that she would do the same for her own daughters in the future. Vasila, one of Ivy's sisters, asked for a fancy dress, and Tableau, the father, felt like that future was far away. Fulfi reassured him it would come quicker than he thought, and Tableau acknowledged that Ivy was already five years old. The family discussed how Ivy would receive her skills at this age. Tableau explained that having a skill meant finding a place to work and earn a living. Ivy's older brother, who had a three-star skill, emphasized the security it brought. He took a dig at Facilla. Fulfi asked Ivy what skill she wanted, and Ivy wished for the tamer skill to be friends with dragons and monsters. Tableau reminded her that skills were gifts from the gods to help them live in their world, and just being friends with creatures might not be enough. To cheer Ivy up, Tableau gave her a freshly carved unicorn. Their family time was interrupted by Luba, the fortune teller, who apologized for coming late but wanted to pray for Ivy's good fortune as it was nearly time for her to receive her skill. Fulfi appreciates the concern and allows it. The fortune teller remembers how young Ivy used to talk about her past life. Ivy's mother complained to Luba, who warned Ivy not to let anyone know about these memories, as it could cause problems. Not even her parents should know about them. The fortune teller finished praying for Ivy, assuring everyone that she would receive a wonderful skill. However, she couldn't predict the exact skill since her fortune-telling ability was only one star. Ivy's older brother made disrespectful comments about the one-star ability, leading his father to scold him and his mother to apologize to Luba on his behalf. The day of Ivy's skill ceremony arrived, and they went to the church. The priest asked Ivy to dip her finger into the chalice and called upon God to gift her with the power to earn her sustenance. The water levitated indicating a divine message. It initially confirmed that she had the tamer skill, making her and her parents happy. However, the bubble burst, and the priest was informed that Ivy had no stars. Her parents were in disbelief, with Tableau thinking it was a mistake. They were told that the divine message couldn't be wrong, and further denial would be considered blasphemous. The priest left in disbelief, considering Ivy abandoned by the gods. Ivy turned to her parents, and her past self likened the situation to an impossibly hard video game. That evening, the family gathered, and Tableau showed frustration by hitting the table and drinking alcohol. Fulfi tried to stop him, but he couldn't understand why their youngest didn't have stars when everyone else in the family did. Ivy tried to speak, but she was told to be quiet. Tableau even doubted if Ivy was truly his child, leading to Fulfi breaking down in tears. Ivy tried to comfort her mother, but her older brother shouted at her not to touch their mother. Facilla goes upstairs and watches in disgust as Ivy's older brother kicks her out of the house. As Ivy walks through the streets, news of her being starless has already spread. People give her condescending looks, and even the village chief expresses hatred towards her. He tells the villagers that Ivy's starlessness is an omen of impending disasters, and they must gather and prepare for misfortune. Some children throw stones at her because she doesn't have stars. Feeling unwelcome, Ivy decides to leave the village. It starts raining, and she becomes hungry. She tries to eat some berries but realizes they are inedible. Ivy takes refuge in a cave and attempts to use her magic to start a fire, but she faints. When she wakes up, she's under a blanket next to a warm fire, and she's surprised to see Luba. Luba informs her that she has less magical energy than most people and warns her not to overexert herself with magic, as it could endanger her life. The fortune teller had foreseen this event but couldn't see its cause until now. She's a bit surprised that being starless was the reason for Ivy's predicament. Luba offers Ivy a comforting bowl of soup, and once she regains her strength, she begins to teach her. She assures Ivy that with the right knowledge, she can achieve almost anything despite her limited magical energy. Luba provides Ivy with a starter pack for her journey, including an old model magic bag that can carry many things and make them feel lighter. Ivy also receives books filled with information about the world, which Luba believes will be useful on her journey. The fortune teller advises Ivy to travel the world and broaden her horizons when the time comes. She suggests heading to a town near the royal capital, but encourages Ivy to settle down if she finds a place she loves during her journey. Luba emphasizes the importance of trust and openness with allies, as hiding things can lead to a loss of trust, and Ivy will need trustworthy allies when the time for battle arrives. Luba, the old lady, teaches Ivy essential survival skills while taking care of her in the forest. Ivy is puzzled by Luba's kindness because everyone else despises her for being starless. Luba shares a piece of history, telling Ivy that in the past, no one had skills or stars, and people lived happily and functioned without them. After three years in the forest, Ivy adapts to her nomadic life and becomes skilled at finding useful things in trash bins. She also learns how to hunt animals for food and cook them properly. One day, while enjoying her meal, Ivy realizes that Luba hasn't visited in a while. 
She senses a presence nearby and hides, confident that it's not a monster. Ivy extinguishes her fire and hides in the bushes as she recognizes people from her village. She suspects that something has happened there. That evening, she sneaks into the village church and overhears that Luba has passed away. Luba was a vital part of the village, and her death is puzzling, especially as it occurred in the summer due to a cold. Ivy lingers to hear her father report to the village leader, shocked to hear him say they will return her to the gods. Emotional turmoil prevails as she listens to the village leader's hate-filled speech, blaming Ivy for Luba's death and calling her a curse because she is starless. He incites the villagers to hunt Ivy down before she brings disaster to their settlement. Ivy awakens from her dream, thinking she has been captured by her parents. She finds Sora on her wound and falls back asleep. The next morning, she is awakened by her slime familiar, and the familiar jumps on her. Ivy reaches for it and realizes her terrible wound has healed. She understands that the slime wasn't trying to harm her but was helping her. Ivy expresses gratitude to the slime for saving her life, and promises to try to live a little longer. Sora and Ivy were asleep when a drop of water woke up Sora. Ivy noticed it was morning and saw that Sora was unusually energetic. They have breakfast before starting their journey. Ivy has mixed berries, and Sora consumes potions. Ivy notices that Sora has grown taller, nimbler, and sturdier, thanks to the blue potions it's been eating. Ivy doesn't bother figuring out how it's happening. She just attributes it to the slime getting healthier. Realizing she's almost out of dried meat, Ivy plans to restock in the next village of Latin. To fund this, she needs to catch enough field mice. Her past self thinks it would be cheaper to cook the meat she catches, but Ivy explains that cooking in the forest attracts monsters. Buying dried meat costs more but is safer in the long term. Sora informs Ivy that it has eaten all its potions and demands more, but she has none left. They set off and come across a dumping ground, hoping to find potions. Ivy finds clothes, but Sora insists on finding potions. After a short search, Ivy finds a box of old potions. Sora eats one, and Ivy speculates that the slime will eat anything as long as it's blue. It even eats a practice healing potion made by a child. Ivy is shocked to see it ingest a red one, curing illnesses. Sora rejected it before, indicating a broadened palate. Ivy presents a green and purple potion, but Sora rejects them. Following her past self's suggestion, she mixes blue and red to make purple. Sora eats it, confirming it bases selection on properties, not color. The duo continues, happy with the nice weather. Ivy is grateful to have met Sora, making her journey less lonely. Her past lives remind her they're always with her, but she excludes them as they are one person. Spotting some no berries, she forgets her trail of thought, eats them, and comments on their deliciousness. Offering some to Sora, but Sora rejects them. That evening, Ivy serves herself a portion of no berries and gives Sora its dose of potion. She wishes they could travel down paths lined with these berries as Sora finishes its food. Ivy is a bit surprised and gives Sora three more as dessert. Sora eats that too and demands more, making Ivy complain because she needs some for when she gets injured on the road. The slime pressures her to give up more. Her past life suggests putting the creature to bed since it will get hungry as long as it's awake. Ivy picks up Sora and tells it that she's going to tell it a bedtime story. They climb up a tree to set up for the night. Ivy reveals that it's a story she heard a lot when she was little. Long ago, the world was at war, so a king gathered magicians who could see the future and had them predict the outcome of the war. They saw the end of the world due to this conflict, and it was a terrifying sight. The magician summoned a child from another world who could use unique and forgotten magic to prevent this fate. This power doesn't exist anymore, and no one knows the effects. However, it is vast, scary, quiet, and lonely. A water drops and it lands on Sora, who wakes up in alarm clock mode. Ivy wakes up and is shocked to see that it's morning. Her past self reveals that she fell asleep while telling the bedtime story. The girl confesses that the story always makes her feel sleepy, so she never heard it to the end. Ivy suddenly becomes alert and checks her bag to see that Sora has eaten all her blue and red potions. The girl is visibly annoyed for a moment, but just lets out a moan. She later sets up a trap in hopes of catching a field mouse. They both jump up in excitement when they capture something. As she makes her way to retrieve her prey, she comments on how much of a big help being able to trade field mice for money has been. She must earn and save money to continue their journey. They suddenly both jolt back when the monster snake she captured lunges at them. She is a little confused as she was expecting a field mouse, she feels like she might be able to sell it. Ivy pulls out a sack from one of her magic bags and quickly covers the snake. After a brief struggle, she manages to tie the mouth of the sack, which calms the creature. She slings it over her shoulder and continues when she smells something. Sora gives his danger a head gesture that Ivy doesn't see. The girl wonders if it's a monster, but she doesn't sense anything like that, so she goes to investigate further. 
She gasps when she comes across the aftermath of an attack. Ivy orders Sora to get inside her bag in case there are any bandits, as they will target it. The scene gets worse when she stumbles on the corpses of the people in the caravan. She grabs her sack and runs quite a distance until she's confident that she's safe. When she finally catches her breath, she notices the large village of Latam in the distance. Ivy enters and immediately looks for someone to report the incident to. The girl spots the sign for the town hall and heads over there. She interrupts the receptionist's conversation with some adventurers. Ivy informs them about the monster snake in her bag when they ask. One of the guys points her to the apothecary if she wants to trade in the monster. She thanks him for the information. However, she informs them of the deceased people she found on her way to the village. This catches the attention of everyone present. The receptionist asks her to come closer to give more details. Ivy states that it was on the road from Latoto Village. She describes how the cart was on fire and people were attacked by monsters. One of the adventurers gets up after hearing this. The receptionist explains that their village could be attacked next if this is true. The party leader speculates that it could have been a bandit attack, but Ivy doubts it based on their wounds. She also points out that the cart horses were also eliminated. If it was a bandit attack, they would have taken the valuable horses. After hearing this, the party leader urgently asks to find the exact location and type of monster responsible for the attack. He plans to submit a formal request through the guild later. Everyone gets up after receiving their orders. The guy thanks Ivy and informs her that she will get a tip reward after they confirm the location. The receptionist can see she's confused, so she explains that people get money for bringing information to any town hall about monsters or people who have passed away from monster attacks. It is more advantageous for them to have information about monsters as quickly as possible. This allows them to deal with the problem before people get hurt. She gives Ivy a document that she would need to present to collect her reward if her information is reliable. The results should be available by the evening. Ivy thanks them and makes her way to the apothecary as directed. The vendor examines the snake monster and informs her that the normal market price for this monster is too guidal. However, she caught a female which is rare, so he's willing to pay three. Ivy is shocked to hear this and begins to do her calculations. One giddle is equivalent to 100 dows, so three giddle is worth 30 field mice. From her reaction, the vendor thinks that she's not happy with the payment. The girl assures him that she is fine with the offer, and the trader asks her to bring them to him if she catches any more. She leaves the shop amazed that she earned three whole gittle, which means she can buy lots of dried meat for her journey. She suggests to Sora that they should go look for some food for it, so they head to the village dump. She wonders if they will find any potions around. The girl gets excited when she spots a load of magic bags. She stacks them, and there are 21 in total. As she thinks about how to take them along with her, Sora hops around eating the potions lying around. There is only so much she can carry while walking. The bags are also older models, so their abilities are all different. Her past self recommends she try putting the magic bags into one another. She puts the first one in and it works. She tries to put that bag into another one, but it doesn't go in. So after trial and error, she figures out the capacity of each bag, and she groups them accordingly. After that, she finds the right order to put the bags in so that everything can fit into one. They head to the town center where Ivy comes across the adventurer's guild. She puts up her hood afraid that someone might recognize her. As she tentatively passes through, she is called by the party leader. He informs her that the information she provided has saved a lot of lives, and they were able to verify everything she reported. The monsters that conducted the attacks were ogres along with an ogre king. Their tracks were around the wagon. Some high-ranked adventurers are being sent to hunt them down. So he warns her not to leave the village till the monsters are defeated. The guy also tells her that her reward tip is available at the guild hall. So she goes straight there. The receptionist asks for the document. Ivy must remove all her new bags to find it. She presents the document and is given five guidel for the information on the five deceased people and reward for the information on the high-ranked monsters. Ivy does the working out and she would need to hunt 280 field mice to make this kind of money. Before she leaves, the receptionist pleads with her to be careful with that large amount of money. She also reminds her to send her bags along. Ivy thinks that everyone is after her money when they stare at her but she finds out that it's because of the bag she's carrying. Ivy heeds the party leader's advice and camps in the village with some other warriors. She looks at her map at their next destination, which is a bigger village called Ladle. We then see that Ivy left Ladam village and ventured into the forest after the powerful monsters were finally defeated. She felt a bit frustrated because the traps she had set up were broken and hadn't caught any creatures. She thought maybe something had stepped on them and worried she wouldn't make any money if she couldn't catch any prey. But her past self reminded her they still had some supplies left. When Sora saw something and ran into the bushes, Ivy followed. 
As she got closer, she sensed something ahead and smelled red residue. Ivy found a badly hurt big cat in the bushes. Sensing some magic from it, she thought it must be a monster. Looking it up in her monster book, she found it resembled a creature called an adendal, described as fierce. The injured creature startled her when it cried out in pain. Seeing how bad its injury was, Ivy knew it wouldn't survive much longer. Feeling sad, she tried to comfort it during its final moments, understanding its pain from her own near-death experience. Ivy strokes the cat, wishing she could have done more to help it. Suddenly, Sora jumps in and surrounds the creature, healing its wounds quickly. As the slime returns to Ivy's hand, she notices its speech pattern has changed, but a monster's shadow nearby makes them both flinch. The tension fades as the cat purrs, showing gratitude for being saved. Ivy reads in her book that it takes five skilled adventurers to defeat the Adandal, making her realize how dangerous it is. Examining the creature closely, Ivy finds it cute and doubts if it's truly an Adandal. As she continues through the forest, the cat follows her. Ivy is surprised but happy to have a new friend. She wishes she could have tamed it fully but settles for naming it Seal. Ivy introduces herself and Sora before they continue together for a bit until Ivy senses people nearby. Sora jumps into her bag to stay safe, while the big cat says goodbye and dashes into the bushes, knowing people would be scared if they saw it. Ivy is surprised the cat is smart enough to understand. After a short walk, she arrives at the gates of Latomi Village. She feels nervous about going in when she sees a tough-looking man guarding the gate. A traveler rudely pushes past her and heads toward the gate. Sora warns of danger ahead. The man freezes when Ajito, the guard, tells him to stop and starts questioning him about his reasons for being there. The guard becomes suspicious and throws the man against the wall when he can't give a clear answer about who he's visiting. Agto opens the bag, and many bottles of illegal happy juice spill out. He calls Velivra to arrest the criminal. Another guard thinks Agto should show some kindness to the wrongdoers. Ivy watches and is amazed that Sora sensed the man was bad. She's afraid to approach the gate because of Agto's intimidating presence, but he catches her eye so she can't back down or look suspicious. She gathers her courage and goes forward, but Agto stops her. He doesn't recognize her and asks about her parents, looming over her. Ivy notices a bug on his shoulder and points it out, which makes him panic a little as he brushes it off. This breaks the tension, but he still wants to know about her family. Ivy says she's from Ladom Village. He's surprised she's so far from home alone and sympathizes with the difficulties her village faces. Ivy is puzzled by his sympathy. Agto suggests she could make a living as an adventurer in the village. The guard says goodbye as Ivy enters the village, curious about what's happening back home. Ivy is impressed by the village's grandeur and heads straight to the butchers. The butcher welcomes her and assures Ivy that they'll buy any fresh prey she catches. The butcher warns Ivy to be careful in the forest, especially because she hunts alone, mentioning monsters called Nanoshi in the area. Ivy thanks her for the advice, buys some dried meat, and leaves. She thinks the Nanoshi might have broken her traps for field mice. Her past self advises against sleeping in the forest while they're in the village. Ivy agrees and goes to the adventurer's clearing to rest. She's amazed by its size, considering the village scale. She's scared to approach another guard she sees, but she does anyway. After a few questions, he gives her a pass and directs her to the section best suited for her situation. He then give her a permit, so that she can come and go without any problem. Ivy sets up her mat and lies down but notices some big tents far away. She wonders if that's where the more experienced adventurers gather. Sitting up, she sees her area filled with small tents and guesses it's for beginners like herself. She admires both types of tents and thinks it would be nice to have one, as it would keep her and Sora safer from the weather and hidden from sight. Remembering she has reward money from the tip, Ivy goes to the market to check prices for second-hand tents. She runs into Ajito, who asks what she's looking for, startling each other. Velivra asks him not to scare Ivy. They find out Ivy wants to buy a tent, and Ajito is surprised she doesn't have one. He wonders if she lost everything when leaving her village, which confirms to them the hardships her village faces. They introduce themselves to Ivy, and Otto eagerly takes her to a great shop run by a skilled old man. Velivra warns Ajito to be careful not to hurt Ivy while pulling her. As an apology, Ajito promises to help Ivy find the best tent. When they reach the old man's shop, he jokes with Ajito that there's nothing for him to buy. He tells the blacksmith he's brought a customer, and shows sympathy when he learns Ivy is from Ladom Village. The guard asks for a high price for a quality tent. The old man explains the different durability levels of tents, mostly based on weight. Ivy is more worried about the price, but she's told it depends on her budget. When she says she only has five giddle, they're surprised. Ivy reveals she has two more gold coins, but doesn't want to spend them. The guards are shocked and wonder how she got so much money. 
Ivy explains she got a reward from Ladum Village for tipping them off about a monster attack. The guards are just glad she's safe. The old man says she can get a good tent for five Giddle. He shows them a light and sturdy tent, the latest model, previously owned by an adventurer named Lazy Joya who hardly used it before quitting to get married. The old man had upgraded the tent and offers it to Ivy for five Giddle, which is a great deal considering it's the same price he paid for it before the upgrade. After they seal the deal, he asks Ivy to mark the tent so she can recognize it easily. She chooses the name Sora in Japanese kanji, a name she feels connected to from her past life. As a bonus, the old man gives Ivy a small magic bag to keep her money safe. It's enchanted so nobody else can see what's inside. Ivy is really thankful for the gift. The trio leaves the shop, and Ivy feels happy about her purchases. She thanks the guards for their help. Velivera reminds them they need to get back to patrolling, so Ajito says goodbye. Ivy heads back to the clearing and sets up her new tent without any problems. She brings Sora out to show him their new home, feeling relieved they'll be protected from the weather. Sora seems just as excited as she is. Ivy feels lucky to have gotten the money, and such a good deal on the tent, making her feel like she got it for free. Ivy wonders if she's allowed to have all these nice things, but decides to celebrate anyway. She plans to go to the city's dump to look for potions while it's still daytime. Since the village is big, she figures people must have thrown away lots of stuff there. As she steps out, some rude adventurers notice her. They come over and accuse her of being a thief, which confuses Ivy. One of them claims her tent belongs to him, but Ivy insists she bought it. This angers the group's leader, who calls her a liar and grabs her. They insult her and try to scare her, but a guard steps in and warns them to behave or get kicked out. The adventurers continue lying, saying Ivy stole the tent. The guard asks for proof, but they can't provide any. They just claim Ivy can't afford such a tent. The guard lets Ivy go and reveals that Acto is the captain of the village watch and Belliver is the vice. He tells the adventurers that Acto and Belliver escorted Ivy to buy the tent. Ivy is surprised to learn that Acto and Belliver are important people in the village. The troublemakers back off, but it's too late, they're caught by the other guards. Agto tells the guard to watch over Ivy and make sure she's safe. As an apology for what happened, the guard gives Ivy a new healing potion. That evening, Ivy is amazed by the potion's quality. She gives Sora his potions while she eats, but he refuses because he senses the new potion in her back. Ivy decides not to give it to Sora in case they need it for an emergency. As Ivy woke up the next day, she was greeted by the Adventure Fields caretaker, who wished her luck for her forest trip. Ivy appreciated his words, but wondered if he mistook her for a boy. Along the way, many adventurers showed concern for her well-being, surprising Ivy. She pondered how they recognized her. Upon reaching the forest, Ivy found her traps destroyed, suspecting Nanoshi's mischief. Worried about her catch, she feared going hungry in the summer. Suddenly, she sensed magic and found Seal with nine field mice. Overjoyed, Ivy hugged Seal gratefully. Sorting the mice, Ivy remembered the meat shop's condition for fresh meat. Hastily, she dressed the catch. Ivy then woke Seal and Sora, urging them to sell the meat in town to earn money. As they conversed, Seal bid farewell with a wave. Ivy thanked her for the bounty. Heading into the forest, Ivy recalled her past life's revelation about the legendary Anandala mentioned in a fortune teller's book. But Ivy didn't think it was as wild as the book said. The frail girl then went to the village and sold all the field mice to the meat shop. The owner was amazed because the meat was fresh and not gamey at all. He asked Ivy for her secret, but she hesitated to answer. The owner realized Ivy was smart for her age and respected her decision not to reveal her secret. After buying all the meat, the owner gave her 855 dao. Before Ivy left, the owner told her to bring more field mice if she caught any, as she would gladly buy them. Ivy thanked her and left. On her way, she met the same adventurers who asked about her trip to the forest and how it went. With a scared expression, Ivy simply nodded to them. She then crouched down behind some boxes and wondered why everyone seemed to know about her. Suddenly, she was discovered by Velivra, who questioned why she was hiding. Ivy shared her concerns, revealing that she felt like everyone was aware of her presence. Velivra explained that it was Captain Octo who spread the word to all adventurers in the village, instructing them to assist Ivy if she ever needed help. He apologized on behalf of Octo, describing him as a good person who could be stubborn once he made up his mind. Upon hearing this, Ivy expressed her gratitude and continued on to the market area. Along the way, she encountered more adventurers who wished her well, leading her to consider staying in the area for a while. Suddenly, she spotted a shop selling zero fruits, a rare item only found in her hometown village. Intrigued, she inquired with the shop owner, who confirmed their origin in Ladom village. Confirming her hometown, Ivy sought more information about her village. 
The shop owner revealed troubling news. Mistress Luba, the protector of the zero crops and fortune teller of the village, had faced difficulties due to the village head's animosity towards her. He disclosed that the village head neglected Mistress Luba when she fell ill, leading to her demise. Ivy recalled overhearing discussions in the church about Mistress Luba's mysterious death during the cold season, raising suspicions about the true cause. Shockingly, the shop owner revealed that the village head was now shifting blame onto a child with zero stars, leaving Ivy speechless. The shop owner then explained that the harvest in Latom Village, known as Zero, had failed, leading to financial struggles. The village head aimed to reduce the population to cope with the hardship. Some villagers rebelled, taking their families and leaving, while others who resisted were expelled. Learning all this, the shop owner asked Ivy about her journey to the town. Ivy shared that her family supported the village head, causing conflicts and prompting her to flee. Hearing her story, the shop owner gave her a zero fruit, encouraging her to persevere, which she gladly accepted. That night, Ivy pondered her family's situation and the village's plight. However, she found solace in her newfound friends and cherished memories from her past life. Eating the zero fruit, she reminisced about its taste from her childhood. Suddenly, memories of Luba flooded Ivy's mind, urging her to go to the neighboring town of the royal capital. Realizing the importance of this memory, Ivy made a mental note to remember it. The next day, she encountered the adventurers again, but this time, she greeted them warmly and expressed her determination to do well in the forest. While setting traps for field mice, Ivy sensed people nearby. She quickly hid Sora in her bag, but to her surprise, the approaching individuals were the same adventurers who had bullied her before. Feeling cornered, they demanded her slime, thinking it was rare. Ivy hesitated and tried to flee, but one of them got caught in her trap. However, the girl swiftly freed herself and caught up to Ivy, holding her tightly. They insisted on getting Ivy's slime, and when she hesitated again, the leader brandished a knife, threatening her life if she didn't comply. Just then, they were startled by the sight of an Indala behind them. Seal approached them, and upon witnessing the legendary monster, one of the adventurers fainted. The other attempted to flee, but Seal swiftly caught up to him with her incredible speed and subdued him. She then handed them over to Ivy, who expressed gratitude for saving her life. Suddenly, Seal sensed something and rushed back to the forest. There, she found Ogto and Velivra, who had hurried over upon hearing a monster's roar and human screams. They inquired about Ivy's well-being, and she assured them she was okay. However, they were surprised to find the three-star adventurers unconscious. At the Adventurers Guild, Ogto informed Ivy that the captured adventurers were wanted criminals, involved in crimes including murder. Although the Adventurers Guild had been investigating them, they lacked sufficient evidence. Thanks to Ivy's assistance, they now had them in custody. For capturing these wanted criminals, Ivy would receive a reward. As Ivy pondered about this, Ogto explained that the Adventurers Guild pays 5,000 Dao for catching an average criminal and 2 Gittle for capturing a murderer. Additionally, for apprehending two murderers, they offer a reward of one ladle each. He informed her that she would receive two ladles and three Gittles. This news left Ivy stunned, unsure of what to do next. Ogdo handed her the reward money and advised her to open an account at the trade guild, cautioning that carrying such a large sum could attract trouble. Taking his advice, they went to the trade guild where Ivy was registered and given a white plate. Ogdo explained that with this plate, she could access her funds at any trade guild in any village or town. Grateful for his guidance, Ivy thanked him, but Velivra, arriving shortly after, scolded Ogto for not informing him about his whereabouts. They then invited Ivy to try the town's specialty, Nanoshi skewers, and she happily accepted. At the famous shop, they enjoyed the skewers, which Ivy found delicious. The shopkeeper, revealing her four-star cooking skill, mentioned that such high skills were rare in the town. Intrigued, they discussed their respective ability and inquired about Ivy's skills. Ivy disclosed that she possesses the tamer skill. However, when asked about the number of stars she has, she fell silent, causing the adventurers to realize they shouldn't have posed such a question. They then reassured her, suggesting that people with many stars often fail to utilize their skills properly and end up on the wrong path in life. Believing Ivy has only one star, they didn't realize she was actually born with none. The following day, Ivy bid them farewell, mentioning her promise to the fortune teller to reside in the neighboring town of the royal capital. She expressed gratitude for their kindness, and Ogto, wearing a happy smile, said he looked forward to seeing her again. As Ivy departed, Balavra informed Ogto that he had gathered information from Ladome Village. He discovered that among the villagers who left, Ivy's name wasn't listed. Most departed as complete family, but there was one eight-year-old girl who ran away alone. This revelation led them to speculate that Ivy harbored a secret, other than hiding her gender. But Balavra tells him he believes in her and that she will reveal everything to them one day.
The next day, as they went towards the next city, Sora ran ahead with lots of energy, and Ivy chased after him. She asked him to slow down, but he didn't listen. Right then, Ivy is informed by her past life and realizes that Sora had been evolving after consuming the wounds of Seal. While Ivy was pondering this, Sora pointed out a field nearby that Nanoshi had dug up. Ivy thought there might be many big Nanoshis around, and if she stayed there too long, they might come after her. Just as she was about to leave, she heard something approaching and quickly hid Sora with her. But to her surprise, it was Seal who was following them. This led to a warm moment as she hugged them both, expressing her love for them. Later that night, Ivy cooked some rabbit that Seal had caught, and after they ate, she mentioned how tasty it was. She offered some to Sora, who politely refused, saying he only liked eating blue potions. The next day, Ivy checked her traps for field mice, but was surprised to find them empty. Wondering what to eat for breakfast, Ivy remembered she had leftovers from the night before. Feeling relieved she wouldn't go hungry, Ivy decided to leave the area. Suddenly, she sensed an evil presence approaching. Confused and alarmed, Ivy started running away from it. The evil aura chased after her, and just as it almost caught her, Ivy saw a shadowy figure. Thankfully, Seal came to her rescue, roaring ferociously at the shadowy figure and scaring it away. Grateful for Seal's help, Ivy thanked her for saving her life, realizing she might have been in serious trouble without her. Suddenly, Seal stopped as she spotted some ogres heading their way. Reacting quickly, Seal threw Ivy off her back and attacked one of the ogres. She managed to bite the ogre, causing it to fall off the mountain and into a stream below. However, since Seal was on top of the ogre, she also fell into the water below. Seeing Seal in danger, Ivy felt worried, but then she noticed another ogre chasing her and hurriedly ran away. Suddenly, she stumbled upon a sinister place where wooden dolls hung from the trees. Confused and scared, Ivy decided to flee, fearing for her life if she stayed there. As she attempted to leave, Ivy found herself trapped in a snare set by the ogres earlier. She cried out for help, but no one came to her aid. Just as one of the ogres was about to attack her, a sudden blast of flame magic incinerated the ogre. This flame spell turned out to be cast by an adventurer named Ladara, who had set the traps for the ogres. He was surprised to find a child trapped instead. To free Ivy from the trap, another adventurer shot arrows to break it open. After Ladara rescued her from falling, Ladara was puzzled why a child like her was there. Before she could explain, they were attacked by ogres. Thankfully, Ladra's group arrived just in time and used their powerful magic to defeat the ogres. With the battle done, Ivy noticed two large slimes guarding them and wondered how slimes could grow so big. However, her surprise turned to shock when the adventurers revealed their true identity. They explained they were tasked with eliminating the ogres spotted in the area and apologized for involving her in their mission. Instead of being upset, Ivy thanked them, acknowledging they had saved her life. The adventurers introduced themselves as the Blazing Sword group, led by Cezel, along with Naga, Shifael, Ladera, and Mila. Ivy introduced herself as well, but due to her appearance, they mistook her for a boy. As they journeyed together, the adventurers were astonished to learn Ivy's destination was Ottawa from Ladom Village. Initially skeptical, they eventually believed her story and invited her to join them since there were monsters in the area, and they were also headed to Ottawa Village. Upon hearing this, Ivy happily agreed to join them and walked alongside the adventurers. As they reached a cliff, Cezelk pointed out their camp where the rest of the adventurers were staying. While looking down from the cliff, Ivy spotted Seal alive below, having survived the fall. Ivy was relieved but worried that if the adventurers discovered Seal, they might harm her. To keep Seal safe, Ivy instructed her to stay hidden elsewhere, which Seal obediently agreed to. The group then led Ivy to their camp and introduced her to the other adventurers before leaving her with Ladera. Ivy noticed their odd behavior, but was surprised when Ladder revealed he was the group's cook. He confessed he wasn't skilled at cooking and often burned meals despite his efforts. Ladara explained he had a three-star flaming skill, but unfortunately, every time he used it to cook, the food ended up burnt. Upon hearing this, Ivy decided to assist Ladera and took charge of preparing the meal, teaching him the cooking process, and explaining the ingredients used. When the meal was ready, everyone was astonished by its appearance. Upon tasting it, they were overjoyed, expressing how they had never experienced such delicious food before, especially from monster meat. However, Ivy believed they were unaware of the herbs and ingredients that enhanced the flavor. The delightful aroma attracted Mila, who also found the meal delicious. Seazelk and Naga praised the perfectly cooked and aromatic dish. Shifail, realizing that cooking was Ladera's responsibility, scolded him for relying on Ivy. Ivy intervened, explaining they had worked together, with Ladera adjusting the fire's heat. This revelation saved Ladera from blame, and he excitedly created fireworks using fire spells. 
Ivy's past life reminded her that fireworks could be enhanced with metallic elements for more beautiful displays. As Ivy pondered this, Mila asked if she was okay. Ivy suggested that with various metals, they could create even more stunning flames. Mila showed Ivy some metals and asked if those were what she meant. Ivy happily confirmed, excited that she now had all the necessary materials. She wrapped the metals in some cloth and asked Ladra to shoot them into the sky and burn them like before. Ladra gladly agreed, and it turned out to be the most beautiful sight they had ever seen. With excitement, Ladra tossed the metals into the air, creating a stunning display in the sky that amazed everyone, including Seal. Afterward, some of them went to sleep while Ladra and Seazilk offered to help Ivy with washing the dishes. Ivy initially declined, insisting she would do it alone. However, Seazilk recognized her sentiment and insisted they assist her. Ivy agreed, grateful, and smiled warmly. Witnessing this, Ladra embraced Ivy and expressed his desire for a caring sibling like her. However, his tender moment was interrupted when Naga intervened and escorted him away. Later, Ivy went to her tent and apologized to Sora for her delay, believing he must be hungry. She offered him some blue potions, which excited Sora. Ivy assured him there were plenty of potions for him to enjoy. As she drifted off to sleep, the other adventurers expressed concern for Ivy's well-being. Cecil remarked on Ivy's selflessness, noting her anxiousness when advised to rest and her happiness when given tasks to help. He interpreted her behavior as stemming from a fear of being abandoned if she wasn't useful. We also see that Ladra is deep in thoughts hearing all this about Ivy. The next day, Ivy is in a place filled with many old potions. She reaches out to collect some to feed Sora. While doing so, she notices some gooey creatures moving around, which surprises her. She wonders if there are other tamers like her in this place. Then Mila enters with two extremely rare galatins that can devour swords. They came to get rid of garbage. Ivy remarks on their rarity. Mila explains that tamers who can control such creatures have high social status. Ivy then asks Mila if she's ever seen a dispersed gelatin before. Mila replies that she hasn't, as it's an extremely rare monster. Ivy's body trembles, feeling a familiar presence that makes her nauseous, reminding her of a past encounter. Mila notices Ivy's distress, but then the group enters, carrying many things. Ladora explains that dealing with ogres was tougher than expected. The leader raises his hand and informs them they are returning home because they completed the mission successfully. Ivy is surprised by this news because she will finally reach Adol. The scene changes to nighttime where they are enjoying drinks. Ivy, however, has prepared fresh shawarma for them, made from American beef with potatoes and onions. She serves it to them and expresses gratitude for their hard work in defeating all the monsters, which is a significant achievement. They eat and rejoice as the food is truly delicious. Then Ivy brings them cuckoo meat soup. Ladora finds it too hot, but the leader expresses excitement about the soup. Everyone enjoys the meal, and Ivy is greatly thanked for her amazing cooking skills. Then Ivy looks behind her and sighs a little, concerned about Seal's well-being. She reassures herself that nothing bad has happened to him. The leader then asks Ivy if she has eaten well too, expressing concern for her nourishment. Ivy assures them that she has eaten a big meal just now. Shivali tells her she's lying and insists she must eat more to survive in this tough life. Then Miss Mira comes and thanks everyone for their achievement, but the leader tells her that she did well too. Mira starts to get to know Ivy and introduces her to her two older brothers, Toltu and Malma. They are twins, the three of them form a group of adventurers called the Green Storm. The twins approach Ivy, acknowledging her intelligence, but Ivy modestly denies it. However, the twins smile at her and express their desire to have her join their group. But Latoro approaches Ivy, hugs her, and informs them that she's already with their group. Then the leader gently taps Latoro on the head and advises him to calm down. After that, they depart. Ivy bids them farewell, but as they do, another group led by Commander Berolda enters. This group, known as the Thunder King, had caused the Green Storm to flee. Commander Berolda approaches them and inquires about the child they mentioned earlier. They confirm that he is indeed very intelligent and has experience in many things. Then, Commander Berolda instructs Selec to accompany Ivy to Adol, and they agree to do so, ensuring her safe journey to her hometown. Hours later, Ivy arrives home and apologizes to Sora for her tardiness. She advises her to speak quietly as the adventurers are nearby. Sora then presents Ivy with the potions, and Sora begins to eat them. However, at that moment, the same unsettling feeling returns to Ivy. Not only that, but the candle starts moving. Sora quickly retreats into the back, and Ivy trembles with fear, but suddenly the fear subsides, and the unsettling presence vanishes. Then Mr. Ladora appears and asks Ivy if she's awake or not. She confirms she's awake, so he implores her to help him prepare breakfast for the next day, as he's reluctant to do it alone. Ivy agrees to help, which makes Ladora very happy. He decides to go and inform everyone else. 
Then, Ivy enters her room and keeps wondering about that hidden presence that appeared and disappeared, suddenly especially since Mr. Latora appeared right after that presence. She assumes that Latora is the source of that presence, but the slime disagrees with her opinion. However, Ivy never blames him as she doesn't possess the power to understand him through it. She wishes she could be like Miss Mira, who is a tamer and has stars that can understand what the Sora says. Sora remains very scared, and Ivy can't comprehend it. She recalls how the person who drinks alcohol and those killers and Sora behaved similarly in fear. Then she asks the Sora about Mr. Lador, and it doesn't fear him. She asks about the rest of the team, and it doesn't fear him either, except when she mentions Miss Mira's name. It trembles in fear again. Ivy understands that there's something unsettling about Miss Mira. The next day, we see Ivy strolling in the city of Ottawa. She heads to the guild where the clerk informs her that since it's her first time in the city, she must complete a form. As Ivy looks at the form, she notices they're asking for her name and hometown. She questions the clerk about mentioning her hometown, and he detects her hesitation. So he inquires about her hometown. Ivy reveals she's from the village of Latomi. The clerk understands her reluctance to mention her village's name. He then asks if she has a sponsor here, and Ivy explains she's sponsored by the village guardian, Agudo, who served as her sponsor when she opened her account at the Merchant Guild. The clerk requests proof, so she shows him the white stone. He asks if he can examine the stone on the table, and when Ivy agrees, the clerk verifies that the stone's story is indeed true, with no issues. He informs her that since Ogudo is her sponsor, mentioning her hometown isn't necessary. She only needs to write her name and purpose. Then he issues her the license required for entering and leaving the city. Ivy expresses her gratitude for his help and continues her tour of Adola, admiring its beauty. Ladora asks if this is her first visit to such a large town, and she confirms it's her first time. Therefore, Latora decides their first priority is to find her a place to sleep. They all work together to set up a tent. Later, the leader requests Ivy to speak with her about something. At night, he informs her about the lurking danger in the town and the surrounding forest. Ivy becomes worried because she thought they had captured all the monsters in the area. He reassures her that the danger isn't from the monsters, but from the people. The leader explains that there's a very serious problem in Outerloo, where people are being kidnapped and sold as slaves by a criminal organization. The town guard located their hideout and raided it. But it seems the information leaked somehow. So the hideout was completely abandoned. People are being abducted, and there are no reports even about these crimes. Ivy asks if she thinks this criminal organization will target her. The leader responds that they target children, saying that a child traveling alone is the ideal target for them. They decided to stay with her for this reason. The leader apologizes to her because she was informed of this troubling news immediately upon her arrival in the town. They will crush the organization no matter what it takes. Until then, she should avoid doing anything alone, and continuing her journey alone would be very dangerous. The guards are watching everywhere. Selzek mentions that the organization operates very discreetly, hoping to find evidence to track them down and apprehend those behind it. Ivy then reveals that she was attacked, surprising everyone. She explains that she was targeted by someone who pursued her. This person then used their magic to temporarily prevent anyone from hearing their conversation. The leader clarifies that it's an earring, a magical tool occasionally obtained from defeated monsters. It's highly valuable, so they only use it in dire situations. Vishali inquires about the last time Ivy was targeted. Ivy recounts, this was before she met the suppression team. She was in the forest, sensing a disturbing presence chasing me. But when a monster appeared nearby, it fled. Vishali asks if Ivy is skilled at detecting presence, to which Ivy confirms, explaining she lived alone in the forest. Ivy continues, revealing that she also felt the presence approached her tent at night but vanished suddenly. Later, Latro was found outside her tent, casting suspicion on Selzik, questioning if he was behind it. Latro denies involvement, stating he approached Ivy to ask for help in preparing breakfast. Vishali comments on sensing a nauseating aura emanating from him. Latro insisted he wasn't involved. Noga pointed out that regardless of Latro's innocence, his arrival might have scared off the presence. He then brought up a significant concern. There could be a member of the organization among the suppression team. This revelation astonished everyone, sparking inquiries into who it could be. Latroa maintained his innocence. Then Shivali turned to Ivy, asking if she had any suspicions. Reluctantly, Ivy mentioned that Mira from the Green Storm crossed her mind. Latroa dismissed this as impossible. Selzik pressed for evidence. Ivy hesitated, unsure of what to do. She feared that if she revealed Sora's information and Mira's suspicious behavior, Sora might be in danger. In the end, Ivy apologized, saying, forget what she said. The scene shifted back to the tent, where Ivy sought advice from Sora. 
Sora reassured her, indicating it would be okay to confide in them. Ivy remembered the old woman's warning about hidden destinies and the consequences of revealing secrets, causing people to lose trust. Ivy debated whether to disclose the information or keep it to herself. In the morning, Ivy steps out of her tent to find everyone gathered, deep in discussion. They activate a charm to ensure privacy during their conversation. The leader shares troubling news. Mira from the Green Storm, as Ivy mentioned, has a dark side. Shivali adds that it's not just Mira, her older brothers are also implicated. Lurtru confirms they investigated Mira's activities and witnessed her secret negotiations with a caravan merchant. When confronted, the trio claimed they coincidentally met him and denied any connection. Natroa reveals that during their conversation, Mira and her brothers consistently used a magical charm to block sound, a rare tool they seldom use casually. Berolda concludes that their secretive behavior prompted the use of the charm, though there's no direct evidence linking them to any significant deals. Chevalier mentions that inquiries at the Merchant Guild revealed no suspicious activities by the wandering merchant, making his sudden appearance dubious. Borolda emphasizes the suspicious circumstances surrounding the merchant, suggesting possible illicit dealing. The yellow-haired member interjects, suggesting caution and speculation. However, Latroa argues that accumulating circumstantial evidence can't be dismissed as mere coincidence. Latroa refuses to believe Mir and her brothers are involved, a sentiment echoed by his companion. The commander apologizes and confirms Ivy's significant contribution in uncovering the truth about Mira. Everyone expresses gratitude to Ivy for her information, despite not disclosing her reasons for suspicion. The commander assures Ivy that her actions were valid. Latera compliments Ivy on her delicious cooking, acknowledging her honesty and trustworthiness. Ivy reflects on her discomfort with lying but appreciates their trust. She then reveals that she is a tamer and that her pet slime, Sora, informed her about Mira. Everyone is surprised by Sora's abilities and uniqueness. Ivy explains that Sora can detect evil individuals, a rare trait for a slime. They agree to keep Sora's abilities secret to prevent potential complications. Ivy emphasizes that Sora is her friend and thanks them for their trust and kindness. The adventurers were surprised to find out that Sora was a disintegrating slime. Balorda, who had been in the occupation for many years, said he had never seen such a rare slime before. Latrua took the chance to praise Ivy for being amazing, as he was the first to interact with Sora. One might think Latrua feels like he's a talent scout, as most of them had only heard of transparent slimes like Sora in legends and stories. Meanwhile, Rickvilt couldn't resist Sora's cuteness and ended up overpetting it until he was pulled away. The others reassured Ivy that Rickvilt meant no harm, as he had a soft spot for adorable animals. However, there have been cases where creatures ended up disliking Rickvilt for overpetting. Latrua recognized Ivy's skill in taming such a rare slime. Rickvilt decided to test Sora's ability by lying about his name, but the slime easily detected the lie. Lockrick speculated that Sora might have known he was lying because they had already introduced themselves. Instead, Lockrick confessed to an incident where Malric secretly drank Shifale's tipsy juice. Sora confirmed this to be true, sparking a fight between Malric and Shifale. After interacting with the slime, they all ate together, but they put up a noise-proof barrier while discussing the fact that three members of the Green Gale were traitors. Seazilk explains how the group of servants has been taking people from the town for a long time. They struggle to gather information because the wrongdoers always manage to escape when they get close to finding clues. It's suggested that there are insiders leaking information to the group, and thanks to Ivy, they now know that the sibling group is involved in this betrayal. Cezilk thinks it would be easier to take action if they catch the Green Gale. Latrua notices Ivy's sadness upon hearing this and shares his disappointment that Mila, whom he's known since childhood, is involved. Rickvelt feels the same about his friend Malma but he's determined to capture them if they're truly bad. Ivy wonders when the group became active. Baralder reveals it's been over 10 years. Initially, people thought the missing individuals were taken by monsters, but seven years ago, they confirmed the existence of the group when Escapes reported their experiences. Ivy concludes there might be other traitors, considering how long the group has operated without being caught. He brings up the failed raid, mentioning a leak. He explains how they had a watch ally infiltrate the organization, but he was killed. Only a few knew about the operation beforehand. The Green Gale would have learned just before, leaving little time to react. This confirms there must be other traitors. Beralda worries about dealing with the Green Gale because a noble endorsed their promotion, which made him trust them. Ivy finds this endorsement odd and wonders if they're close to the noble. Beralda doubts it. According to reports, they helped the noble with a problem, leading to their promotion, 
which is rare because nobles usually look down on adventurers. It's stranger when she learns the siblings did just one job for the noble. The Blazing Sword and Lightning King party were also asked to work for the same noble. They were asked many personal questions. Ivy suggests they were being assessed for their involvement in the conspiracy. They're surprised she noticed before them. Ivy surprises her companions by revealing that she's only nine years old. They're shocked because she seems much older sometimes. She explains it's her birthday and everyone wishes her, which makes her happy as she hasn't heard birthday wishes for years. Some adventurers find her cooking skills abnormal for her age. Internally, Ivy credits her skills to her past life. Aroldor realizes the case just got more difficult if a traitor is among the nobility. Sazelk agrees and suggests confirming who in higher positions can be trusted with this information. He asks Ivy and Sora to help vet the Guildmaster. The next day, they visit the Adventurer's Guild and meet Guildmaster Rugly. Sora hides in Ivy's back, indicating he can be trusted. The same goes for Captain Berksby and Vice Captain Agrop of the Town Watch. Beryl pretends a random crystal is a special device Ivy gave them to detect good or bad people. However, this crystal doesn't last long and turns into a stone after a week. The guildmaster suggests using it quickly to find traitors among them. The captain agrees to help and calls in all the watch members for testing. They head to the house the organization used as a base. When they raid it, they find it empty with no evidence left behind. They greet the guards at the door, and one named Maljajula is flagged as a traitor. This strengthens their resolve to catch the rest. They test all the guards by the end of the day. Out of 157 watchmen, 38 are found to be traitors. Berksby is shocked that so many infiltrated their ranks. It explains why the organization always escapes when they get close. As they discuss this, Count Fultoria and Lord Ferranda enter. The Count checks on their investigation, intrigued by Ivy. Fultoria introduces himself, but Sora, the slime, identifies him as a bad person. Foranda also greets them, and Sora considers him good. After they leave, it's revealed that Faltoria is part of the organization. Everyone is shocked because Faltoria is seen as a hero in the town. Berksby feels guilty because he gave Faltoria details about the raid, leading to the demise of their spy. Sazelk advises him not to blame himself, as their anger should be towards the organization. Ivy notices that Faltoria arrived shortly after them, suggesting it wasn't a coincidence. If a noble is part of the organization, his arrival can't be random. The captain notes that the traitors in the watch haven't left their posts, indicating the town might be infested with enemies. Latru isn't surprised there's no evidence if that's the case. Beryl doubts they could have removed all the evidence in time, considering other watch members would have noticed. Since not everyone is involved, Ivy asks where Malgajula searched. They realize he likely received orders to misdirect the investigation away from the room with incriminating evidence. They're impressed by Ivy's analytical skills despite her age. They head to the room Malgajula was in charge of and relieve him of duty. When it's clear, they search the room quickly. Ivy remembers about checking for a trick bookcase like in stories. Though she doesn't know what a movie is, she inspects the bookshelf and finds a worn-out book. Using a chair, Ivy pushes the book, revealing a hidden door. She falls, grabbing everyone's attention. They discover a hidden room with chests and documents. They praise Ivy's detective skills. Opening the chests, they're shocked by the amount of money inside, revealing the organization's enormity. Beralda believes leaving the evidence and escaping was their best option. Another box contains documents of their operations, filled with evidence of abductions. Captain Berksby thinks it's best to leave everything untouched so the organization won't know they found the evidence. They put back the evidence and leave the house. Sazelk, Berksby, and Berolda have been secretly meeting to plan their next steps. Latru points out how Ivy and Sora helped solve the case, but now it's dangerous for Ivy in the city. He offers to accompany her anywhere she wants to go. Later, they go to the laundry for Ivy to wash her clothes. She's surprised to see a magic water bucket for those who can't use water magic. Latru explains it's common and he even has one for cooking since he can't use that magic. Latrua takes the chance to talk to Ivy about pretending to be a boy. She apologizes, and he understands it's safer to travel that way. He suggests keeping it a secret from the others for now. Suddenly, Mila joins them and offers to go out alone with Ivy, but Latrua insists on coming along. They agree on a place to go, but the twin brothers also show up, saying they're going to have fun ominously. This bring an end to our episode. Subscribe our channel for more of this recap and also feel free to check out our other videos. Thanks for watching.